Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, salam sejahtera. And a very good afternoon. Uh, Architect Wan Sofia Wan Ishak, Chairperson of PEM CPD Committee. Architect Nur Zakia Ashad, Chairperson of PEM Housing and Urban Wellbeing Committee. Learned and distinguished speakers and presenters. Welcome to PEM Online Series, Kata Kota or Urban Talk, Edition to Resilience of E-Government During Pandemic or Emergencies. This is a collaboration between PAM CPD Committee and also PAM Housing Urban Wellbeing Committee for PAM Online Series Season 2. We would like to thank all the learned and distinguished presenters, Dr. Siti Istiana Mazhur from Mampu, Encik Saifu Bahri Muhammad Saleh from uh, Merah Network Seran Barhad, and Dr. Zati Hakim Azizul Hassan of University of Malaya, for spending their precious times with us to share their thoughts on Kata Kota episode 2 today. Let us begin the program uh, for today by offering our prayers in any manner of our beliefs to the frontliners whom has stood fast in the fight against COVID-19 as well as those who have left us as a result of COVID-19. A moment of silence, Alpha Teha. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, PAM's aim for these four webinars, two so far, this is the second one, is to highlight and appraise the role of architects during times of emergencies in the context of built environment and especially the urban areas. In the first episode, uh, Katakota has explored the hard lessons learned about our current city's morphological issues and also how the cities need to rebound and adapt to the new notions. How are cities to cope after the incisive deadly pandemic of COVID-19. We have assembled the forefront, the urban design and also city planning to give us some insights and offer proactive solutions and manners to handle them. Now, in the second episode, we shall examine how much touted e-government has fared during the COVID-19 MCO. Anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. So the test of a country's resilience is the effectiveness of government machinery in the time of crisis. Expectation from investment in e-government are high and many of us may have found pretty much ineffectual websites and inoperative service disappointing during the height of the MCO. The level of government closest to the people, the local government seemed strangely absent as the telephone calls and email went unanswered websites and unresponsive. With the insistence of the online submission, surely the aspect of the business would have been functional. But is that a fair statement? How do we as stakeholders help improve the way things are done? How do we prepare for the next crisis or pandemic for the matter? So together with our panelists today, uh, we would like to explore these questions and learn about our local authorities and e-government and how uh, the panelists here can actually work in collaboration to ensure that we will not face the same situation if the emergency calls again. If you remember correctly in the SDG, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 goals. The 17th goal is very important, which is collaboration with other parties in order to achieve a goal. So it is with great honor for me to have architect Nozakia Arsha to give a welcome remarks. Architect Nozakia. Um, first of all, thank you, Architect Moose, for being the moderator for the second time. And there'll be two more episodes where Architect Moose will also be the moderator. First of all, I would like to wish a very good afternoon to all registered participants and thank you for participating in this city talk. And most of all, here, I would like to thank and welcome our panelists. Uh, Dr. Zati Hakim, Inchet Shafu Barim, and Dr. Siti Istiana for making it possible to have our talk today. Well, uh, over the years we have faced with so many challenges and I think these uh, few months that we started with from December is the latest challenge that we faced and the strongest I could think of. 
it is the spread of coronavirus uh, that is for COVID-19, which resulted in global pandemic. To curb the spread of the virus, our government resorted to movement control order, MCO, from restricted MCO to control MCO and now remedial MCO. It is the phase due to all this, it has strongly affected our working mode and style and we are into the new normal. During these phases, our government is going through the e-government administration and we wonder how our e-government administration fared through, as uh, Architect Moose have said just now and elaborated, how much this phases has influenced and changed the mode of working style and the administration, how much we, have, we could learn from this difficult time. So, with all these distinguished panelists and presenters, let us all sit back and listen to the presentation by them, who will enlighten us and will bring us through to explore further on the topic on local authorities and e-government. Without further ado, I would like to call upon our moderator, Chief Architect Mustafa Kamal, to move on with our presentation and to welcome our distinguished panelists. Thank you. That must take on. Thank you very much, Akita Nozaki Ashad. Okay, we'll now proceed with paper presentations by the invited speakers. Before we go on, just to inform all participants, please post your questions on the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen if you're on the Zoom. Uh, and if you're following on the FB Live, uh, please put it on the comments bar. So we shall use the voting method and uh, those questions that have the highest voting will get to be answered online. So let's begin with the first presenter, Dr. Siti Ishjana Mazur from Mampu. Please welcome Dr. Siti. Your floor is yeah, admin from Thank you, architect Mustafa and architect Nuzaka. And uh, I also want to appreciate uh, Pam for having me here today and uh, let Mampu share uh, what we have. Uh, maybe we can uh, have a very good discussion on how we move forward in terms of uh, prospering Malaysia. So can I get the slide please? Thank you. Um, I can say that uh, COVID-19 is a um, blessing in disguise because we've been struggling to promote digitalization in Malaysia for quite some time and the take-up is quite slow. But uh, with uh, COVID-19, when the demand is there and uh, everybody was very concerned in terms of uh, having uh, to sit still in our house, so a lot of things actually been taken care in terms of how do we fare in the well-being of our house and also in terms of the economy? So if um, I can at least uh, share with you what Malaysia Digital Government uh, have done uh, for not only for COVID but for the, uh, the whole of government. So the next, can we do the next? I'll be covering on... Uh, next please. Okay, I'll be covering on the current landscapes. How do we respond and what are the initiatives that we have done so far? Yeah? So next, um, I have in common with uh, all of you, I think, in terms of the new architect. Uh, I know Pam is more about uh, building landscapes uh, architect, but in our um, schemes, we call it uh, enterprise architect, architecture architect or IT architecture. So next, can we go to the next one? These are the areas of concerns. Uh, next, please. These are the area of concerns for uh, building architects, I think. Um, uh, I don't have to uh, clarify further on this. But uh, almost the same uh, concern is actually based on the lifestyle. Um, when we are talking about e-government or digital government, we are actually looking into two areas well-being and also the economy. So these are what our stakeholder has concerned in terms of how do we fare post-COVID. So 
uh, in the digital government uh, development, what we are having in mind now is actually changing the mindset and also the architecture of how we develop the digital solutions. Next, please. So uh, in the architecture uh, and designing the digital solutions, we have put some principles that uh, not only are we are looking into uh, silos or agency-based uh, solutions, but more towards end-to-end -to -end solutions. So when we design uh, e-government services or digital government, they must leverage on the uh, capabilities of online, mobile, all the digital devices like sensors, wearables, and the services shouldn't be attached to any agencies per se. So we should look into the common services that we share. How many of you actually have to register to each agency services and put all your details online to be shared among agencies? So if we only have one, now we are looking into having one uh, collection of information from the citizen to be used among all agencies. So you don't have actually to put all your data all over. So we are looking into the end-to-end -end services and also it is a citizen-centric services. So the services must be digital in mind. Meaning to say, if we have, for example, like now, we have to print our um, road tax, for example, uh, we might have to change the way, new norms, the way that we do in terms of digitize the road tax rather than we have to print it. So that is what we put in as principles, especially in terms of payment. Nowadays, I think cashless is much more receptable than before. To have all this, we actually put in place the sustainable and resilient uh, infrastructure for the whole of government. Now we are embarking on secure cloud and also hybrid cloud that um, relies not only uh, for the local and uh, government uh, cloud, but also the private. Of course, cybersecurity is a must for every solutions that we come up with to enhance the privacy and trust among the consumer and also the provider. Next, please. So how do we respond in a COVID? I will be sharing uh, two areas. One is in terms of infrastructure, or we, we are concentrating in terms of digital communication. So I think uh, everyone knows about this, that you have to stay at home and communicate digitally. So these are the services that we give during uh, COVID-19 through my government uh, unified communication. We are using Skype for business, something like this. So uh, the data says that we have 953% uh, increase significantly during the COVID-19. Even though uh, May, in May, we already uh, come to work uh, to the office, it's still high, the number is still high. So I think the adoption is very good. That's why I say, uh, Blessing in these guys, right? So without this, uh, we're actually spending some uh, money of the government to have all the uh, infrastructure in place before with very minimal use, but now it is increasing. Next. So with uh, digital communication in place, what we have uh, embarked during the short uh, periods of COVID is that we developed the MySejahtera application uh, in 48 hours. Yeah? So it shows that we have the capability to uh, get to the market very fast with all the standardization and also collaboration of all agencies. 53 agencies actually collaborate in this. Yeah? And of course, the second one, I think this one everyone knows, online marriage ceremony is very new. It's a new norm. If you find that your husband is in front of a computer wearing a baju melayu, you have to ask lah, yeah, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Things like that. All right. So we also keep, uh, able to um, introduce the virtual clinic, whereby we reduce the numbers of appointments and also uh, patient and doctor communications. 
the take up is very good. Uh, of course, agencies now are using uh, digital communication uh, to uh, do the, their meetings and discussions. Online training is also another area that we are working on. So next. The next one is on the uh, digital transaction or digital services. Um, because of post-COVID, everyone was like uh, very much into digitization. So what we do is actually we look into the whole of government application and services and we come up with a number of uh, 9,101 services, which is 88%, which is already online. Uh, about 20% is still uh, manual because the, the services need to be manual. So uh, within those uh, numbers, 29% is already end-to-end, -end, meaning to say it's already integrated between agencies. One of the examples that I share here is Malaysia Biz, which is one-stop center for business community to register and get licensed for their startup. Um, one of the partners is the Lembaga Architect Malaysia. Yeah. So that is how we actually transform the services for the government, uh, for the people from the government. Yeah. Next. Okay, how do we achieve this? Yeah. We have a lot of initiative in uh, digital government. So recently, we changed the mindset of the people from e-government to digital government. So what is the malicious context of digital government is actually to take advantage of digital data. So next, that, uh, that is why in the, our strategy in 2021 to 2025, we actually go to all out in terms of the data governance, data governance, data sharing, in terms of legislations, we are looking in, uh, uh, into 700 legislations of all government legislation to look into which one is the hindrance, which one is supporting. So uh, we intend to look into the data analytics as well and open data, of course, open data, we already have done that. And also uh, because of that, it will enable the inclusive digital and integrated services. To have this, we need an agile governance, of course. So we are looking into the uh, national level governance so that we can facilitate not only the government agencies, but also the industries that work within the same ecosystem. Of course, the tech talent and on the value of shared services is, uh, is a common uh, things that we are doing. Right? So next. The value of uh, innovating uh, digital services, we look it into three areas here. Yeah? Uh, this is our mantra, la, 3i. Yeah? 3i is actually we have to make sure that the services must have an intelligence in it, rather, whether it is using IoT, robotics, or AI, or even the data analytics itself. Integration in terms of organizational as a whole, not only agency-based uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, now the challenges is uh, making sure that everybody working together in the same environment, even though you have a different uh, background. And of course, uh, the services must have an impact in terms of economy, in terms of socials. You know? So we are looking, for example, like now is uh, on the donations and also grant. Uh, if you know the government have many grants, so uh, a lot of agency is giving grants. So if we have one common uh, platform for, so that we can apply only once with the eligibility that um, already built in, then maybe the managing of grant is much more effective. Next. Um, I don't have to explain this. I think architect knows that we meet standards. So government have standards built in in their services in digital services through my government enterprise architecture. So we build standards here, yeah, next. Um, Mampu is also uh, a central agency that lead the digitalization. So uh, the way that we design services, we want uh, the services to be designed based on experience of the customer, whether it is individual or a community or business uh, in, yeah. So what we, we do is actually we help agencies 
uh, that needs to change their services towards digital or even uh, data driven. Uh, we have all the consultative and also the responsibility in giving them uh, the resources. So next. These are several of uh, central agencies initiative uh, that we uh, built uh, the infra, the digital infra in the e-government that we built for the use of all the agencies, uh, government agencies. So uh, with all this uh, consolidated infrastructure, the agencies don't have to, um, they don't have to put their uh, people uh, to do all the managing of infra. So they have to focus on the digital services that they have to produce. Uh, with that, I thank you. I hope uh, I give some lights in the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Stiana. That was very uh, encouraging because, uh, you know, uh, things that we never expected, you know, the unprecedented uh, happening can actually uh, make things happen. So, um, okay, uh, we will now continue uh, with the next presenter. The next presenter is uh, Cik Saifu Bahari Muhammad Saleh. Uh, he's uh, a past president of MSPC, Malaysian Services Providers Confederation, but he is also a well-talented digital uh, Sifu uh, from PCOM also. So, uh, please welcome Cik Saifu Bahari. Terima kasih, Mos. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, um, panelists. Yeah. Uh, the next few minutes, I will go through some slides. In the angle, uh, as most mentioned, my background is uh, ICT for the last 38 years. Advisor of PICOM, now uh, past president of Malaysian Service Provider Confederation. I will zoom my presentation towards not just uh, technology, because it is an enabler, but also how it affects the industry. Then I think the one kata, kata kota, <laughs> urban talk is basically the effectiveness of uh, an expectation from the Malaysian e-government. So I'll give some comments on that. <laughs> so, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Pam, for inviting me. Uh, let's go on the slides. I'm breaking my slides into three parts. Yeah? Uh, the first part is basically to give you the context of what we are facing now. I mean, we are already undergoing uh, the lockdown, and then we are in the midst of it. And then the second part, I will mention and refer juga memberi um, examples of industry that's affected and what we are facing now. Then the third part is basically post-COVID. Perhaps I can give some suggestion and also how to prepare so that the lesson learned so we can face future crisis of pandemic in a much better scenario. Now the first slide, if you look at it, the LIT, maknanya that industry has really been lit up, is already on fire, is affected. And these are the potential user, uh, losers. And on the right, the green stuff, and the other greens are the potential winner. Look at the bottom left, and as everybody know, yeah, semua dah uh, nampak uh, kebersanan dan juga problems that faced by the tourism and the leisure industry. They are the first hit. Bermana people cannot travel, uh, they are not allowed to gather in big uh, numbers, you cannot visit uh, the uh, uh, places, people are not, the hotels are closed, so all public places are closed. So tourism and leisure is the first industry that's really been really hit bad. As well as the aviation maritime, except for the essential services, the mana, uh, people still, uh, business still have to go uh, export, import of PPE, the gloves, the uh, masks, uh, all that uh, the, uh, still um, have to function. And I think this is not just uh, in Malaysia, regionally as well as global uh, are being affected by this uh, COVID-19 and by this pandemic. And bear in mind, the COVID-19 uh, COVID has affected people and you look at um, facing not just um, re recession, yeah, the crisis, we call it pandemic now, 
We are also facing some country will go into a depression. So we're still looking and closely monitoring while health is important, but now people are looking who can manage the health, who can uh, do proper social distancing, contact tracing and treating the patient. Um, but there are some countries still facing it with a spike of new cases of while waiting for the vaccine to happen. Now, just briefly, automotive, construction industry, manufacturing, financial services is also affected, education. Uh, apart from we can do now distant learning, there'll be new norms, oil and gas. But for Malaysia, especially uh, all the services, the e-government, we should be looking at supporting the areas of agriculture. E-commerce in Malaysia has grown more than 40%. ICT, of course, the enabler, we should capitalize on doing virtual meetings, virtual conference, and many technology that can assist us to go out of this uh, pandemic and perhaps uh, we can look at new economic activity that will be able to contribute uh, to companies or to the industries. Personal healthcare, obviously, F&B retail, apart from the logistic has been affected, and of course, medical supply and services is going to be key, how we're going to manage it from now on. Okay, next slide. Now, I would also mention, this is the latest, I extracted it from uh, MOF, we are at the recovery stage. The Malaysian government, um, together with some countries, have been uh, managing this crisis. I think we are also an exemplary of it. We have looked at the resolve, resilient restart. We are at this point in time at a recovery mode. Alhamdulillah, I think our cases are less than 10 over the last few days. I think MKN and also um, KKM is focusing on it. Uh, and are looking at uh, zero, uh, even in the case of fatality, and zero in terms of new cases uh, the next couple of weeks, then we can go to re revitalize and reform uh, our country as well as the industry. Next slide. It's good to know that we are uh, recovering in a nice manner. Good to know the past. This is the first quarter 2020 compared to the first quarter 2019. The five main sector construction to the furthest left has been affected more than 7%, 8% roughly. Manufacturing, because uh, there's still early stage, because March only we did a lockdown, and the global scenario is affected that way, but January, February, March, they're still, uh, is going downwards, but manufacturing is still a slow growth of 1.5%. Agriculture, obviously people can go out, a lot of their produced products are not being distributed, they are also being affected uh, in a big way. You notice the services sector uh, is growing up. And in fact, the second quarter, you'll be looking at how services sector contributes uh, to the recovery and as well the growth of the economic uh, activity in the country. Mining and quarry, of course, is going down. That is the statistic from the Department of Statistics. Next slide. Another context, I, I struck it, I log on to Mampu website and I noticed that Mampu has a KPI target by this year, the strategic targets. And Alhamdulillah, I think over the years, eh, with our knowledge, digital economy, the country has invested a lot uh, in the infrastructure. While it's not complete yet, I think we should still, uh, because technology obsolete is very fast, so we need to still reinvest and rediscover uh, ourselves in this new uh, area of technology. You notice all the targets that's being done is, uh, is, is heartening to show the government is looking at the sharing of data, the hub, the number one cloud platform. So we are going on the internet, registrar, uh, agencies, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Siti Tadi, uh, 23, uh, 53 agencies are consolidating. And you can even come up with new application very fast, within 48 hours uh, on this My Sejahtera. And I've used it many times, uh, using the QR code. So I think that is a thumbs up for Malaysia uh, doing digitalization and uh, uh, capitalizing on the technology. Now we have to look at that 10% uh, ICT personnel. So digital workforce is an area that we need to really enhance further that's training, even though we need to import the skills, especially in the cybersecurity and the rest. Yeah? So there's one ICT operating model, good thing. I look at the one all that, so that's centralized, but we need to decentralize in terms of taking care of like the critical national information infrastructure. So that has to also catch up 
in the big data, in the analytics, AI, and all that. So this is good, but in progress, and I will comment afterward on what I see on the ground, you know, where the rubber hits the road. Next slide. I have vet through a lot of the models, and this is from KPMG. This is also highlighted in STAR recently. Uh, Post-COVID, yeah? uh, this slide I will mention to you what thumbs up and what thumbs down as I see it, how e-government and how all the industry are being addressed uh, in terms of how the rakyat actually being managed uh, by this e-government. But uh, safe to say, the shift of localization, digital gets real. This is a real uh, scenario on crisis. Well, a lot of businesses have to retain their cash to be able to survive once this crisis is over. The variable cost model, um, I give a, uh, an example here. I'm, in the, I'm on the board of the uh, one insurance uh, listed company. Uh, in India, you buy your uh, insurance per year where you have to pay the premium. These days, people are saying you buy your insurance, but you, when you drive your car, that's when the insurance switch on. So it's like pay as you use. And you can even apply your insurance to your multiple cars. So you can see the variable cost model and the new ways of actually business model are being addressed too. Sensing control cap capabilities, smart cities and all that, I think Malaysia is embarking on it. Supply chain, uh, we resilient, the building agility, so we need post MCO to reset on the financial and the operation and the technical uh, technology data. Now hang on to this because I want to mention here, uh, I will commend generally in terms of what's good and what's bad as I see it uh, in terms of um, the e-government uh, in servicing the rakyat and in servicing the business community. The thumbs down, <laughs> which is what you need to improve, I'm being a bit more uh, honest in terms of, there are cases that we notice uh, the website are not being updated, systems is always down, and there are some overload in some of the critical scenario. So we need to anticipate this um, uh, in the next pandemic. But we are in the midst of it, so I'm sure we can improve that a lot. Second scenario, that, that, the first one is actually capacity planning, uh, pre M, you do simulation, that is key. And that's one of the uh, uh, an area that we can improve. The second is basically, you notice, I think Dr. Siti mentioned there are nearly eight, nine, a thousand percent over increase in all these cases, but there are a lot of fake news. The social media, that's another thing. How do you manage that? If you don't manage that well, I think that is a disruption of everyday life while people are during their, their lockdown, but it is a disruption of uh, the economic and the business community. Where do they go? And then some people may be highly political, that's not right. But that's and a second area, how do you manage fake news, personal data protection, and there are a lot of hackers and also people taking advantage, especially in the banking area. And you can hear a lot of people are losing money and being con uh, in the background. And this is not just local, yeah, even foreigners uh, would capitalize during the lockdown. Third area. Oh, I do five minutes, oh, I Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I can do that because after this is going to be my three last slide. Great, thank you. Then the third one is basically, I want to highlight, it is also at federal level as well as state level. Even personally, I've gone through the system while I think they are prominent and all that, but the people side of it so that they can address the responsiveness when people email, when people call, when people send in WhatsApp. So that area, I think uh, both at federal and state level, we can certainly improve. The comment I have is that the Hello. promptness, the reply of customer service oh, is going to be very key. Jadi moderator, saya kau balik dah sejam lebih ni. Yes. Now the thumbs up, yeah. Okay, those are the three top thumbs down. The thumbs up are basically, I mean, I'm impressed with the My Sejahtera, the Future Agency. I'm impressed with MKN. Every day we get the news and the KKM as they broadcast uh, the. Uh, then we can monitor and then we know what to do. So that's number one. Number two, and I think the daily brief in terms of health, economy, social, as well as political scenario, we are all being updated. And that is one of the success factors why Malaysia has managed this pandemic pretty well compared to a lot of countries. I think we are also a reference to the Western world. And lastly, 
Uh, this is key for our business community, the stimulus packages. Even right now, we are aware of the uh, assistance, the financial, the access to capital, MOF, Bank Negara, SOXO, income tax. I was just being income tax because I received the letter. And the way that they handle social distancing, the way they handle the reception, I think I give a thumbs up. So they can lock on to their system and they can actually address the customer. And also TNB. So, but we still anticipate TNB to give us some discount because they, they had their billion dollar uh, profit. Uh, uh, all because people stay at home and use a lot more econ, right? Okay, next slide. So you, you put in your mind on this post-COVID scenario, this digital transformation framework, this is work in progress. I've been asked by government to look at how to help businesses. So you look at the strategy on the business model on the right, the funding, the platform, the solution, the demand area. You look at the bottom, this is key, the digital workforce, the cost optimization and the training. And you look on the left, where the tools, you go to cloud or you decentralize the automation, the digitalization, and then to monetize whatever they are doing. And on the top part, while government has given some financing um, model and the grants and schemes, secondly, you can approach VC, MNC, but lately government has given uh, five more licenses to crowdfunding. So uh, you will hear more of this uh, framework as we broadcast it, in fact, next month. So there is a big uh, uh, seminar going on. Next, okay, Moose, uh, my next three slides, <laughs> uh, moving in very fast. Now, these are just some points for uh, the government as well as business community, you need to transform. This is a knowledge-based industry, digital economy, government will start taxing you digitally and all that as we uh, recover from this uh, pandemic. Yeah? Leadership is important. People has to look into and managing it. Your tool can be as best as possible. You can buy the best tools, but if you don't train your people, you don't provide with the leadership, it is still a waste. So the transformation has to be omni-experience. It can be a hybrid, traditional way, uh, as long as it gives you the returns. Information, uh, you can send uh, all your staff uh, for a lot of training. Yeah, The operation model and the work source transformation is key. Don't reduce that. The change management in parallel have to do it. Next slide. Again, to point the prediction, the e-commerce has grown more than 40%, I mentioned. If people are moving forward, and uh, this pandemic, the new norm will still be around the next uh, year end, and in fact, the next 2020. So you've got to modernize, you've got to capitalize on all these uh, latest AI, big data, robotics, as Dr. Ziki mentioned. My son is, uh, is doing robotics exoskeleton, so I've got to bring him back and try to contribute in that area. There will be disruption, and let me tell you, you should simulate this environment, even though we are not uh, addressed having another pandemic, but you should simulate and should test out our system uh, ongoing, uh, quarterly if possible. Next slide. Now, um, uh, my final slide, Nose. <laughs> in anything that you do, in any uh, the disruption, there was always be focus on information. People were denying. You must support it. That's why the e-government, uh, as best as we can, need to support the country, the rakyat, and the businesses. So you have to look at the confidence, the moral, and the effectiveness of what we have. We need to invest more, for sure. And of course, we have to look at the cost, the cost of ownership and the returns. People will be angry if they don't manage it well. Alhamdulillah, Malaysia have managed it well. And we're now in a stage of exploring. Look at the past, look into the future. So to stage the direction and to have the acceptance and encouragement, the change curve, of, change curve of Malaysia is important and this chart shows very well. We need to uh, exit out of this pandemic in a much more productive manner. Hence that productivity for using technology driven by Malaysian Productivity Center with all the nine nexus, this is key. Okay, finally, I think that's a, my thank you note. Uh, send me an uh, email or call me through them. Uh, to have some slides and to have some of the work in progress. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I'll pass back to Mustafa. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Well, when you are ready uh, on the dive, uh, so you get excited. <laughs> so this is what you are. And I hope we can uh, achieve those uh, expectations and also manage the optimism. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, I go for the next uh, uh, ex uh, talk, uh, which is uh, for uh, Dr. Zati Hakim. So she's the uh, uh, doctor that does the AI in Unicef Malaya. So let's let's hear from her uh, so that uh, she can tell you what 
is in store. So please welcome Dr. Zakti Hakim. Thank you very much, Akita Mustafa. Uh, thank you, Pam, for having me today. Um, can I get my slides up, please? Okay, Assalamualaikum and hello everyone who's watching the seminar today. Uh, my name is Zati from University of Malaya, specifically from the Department of Artificial Intelligence, Faculty of Computer Science and IT. Um, I'd like to share today um, my observation, my thoughts and hope regarding e-governance, um, morely from an academic perspective. Next. So I believe everyone would agree that uh, documenting and recording of information is a big part of our job, uh, regardless whether you are in the government or private sector. Uh, so even if you are a teacher at school, uh, paperwork, admin duties really consumes our time, like uh, multiple hours per day that we have to do this. Um, AI and automation can actually help government agencies to free up billions of labor hours per year. And we can use that time to focus more on uh, critical tasks. Uh, uh, at this point, when we are um, having all this uh, blizzard of paperwork to be done, we are unable to do the most important uh, task for human, which is the creativity thinking, uh, decision making, and etc. Uh, but of course, with technology as powerful as AI, a government should look at a careful implementation because um, you know, this is a sentiment of our people at this age uh, with AI and automation coming in. They have this fear of job loss, uh, de-skilling. Uh, they have this fear of reduced worker morale. So these are potential pitfalls that government must always uh, keep in check, uh, else uh, we cannot implement this well. Next. Okay, so however, um, uh, AI, if it's done right, okay, it has a huge benefit. And I've seen the benefit uh, in time of crisis like this. For example, um, let, me, let me try put it in a, a use case, uh, COVID-19 as a use case or as an example. So um, I think everyone is familiar with the requirement or the SOP uh, for COVID specific uh, uh, requirement. We have two, first is the fever screening. And the second one is contact tracing. I think uh, school children also know about this uh, today. So in order for the government or for us to fill this requirement, um, we actually, you know, in our attempt to um, uh, achieve this requirement of fever screening and contact tracing, we actually introduce new problem. Uh, the first one is manual contact tracing methods require users to leave uh, their name and personal information inside logbook. So if you go to shop these days, we need to leave our names uh, in the logbooks. And we have cases coming up where, you know, if these um, information is stolen uh, from these logbooks, uh, there are some people who already uh, log report that they've been sexually harassed, uh, they are a victim of scam and other illegal activities. Next. Okay, so uh, what Malaysia need currently and immediately is a one-stop solution that solves number one, a hands-free temperature scanning at every checkpoint. Number two, a personalized tracking of own uh, 14 days temperature history. And number three, uh, a nationwide COVID-19 tracking, uh, per, uh, preferably done by government agencies and authorities. And I, I know uh, Mampu has done my Sejahtera, that's an excellent um, effort. And uh, we at UC Malaya, we're also in support of uh, what the government is doing. And we also have, uh, you know, attempted at an AI and automation solution where, you know, uh, to handle task number one, we uh, develop an IoT-enabled thermometer, uh, where for task number two, we develop a user web application where uh, customers or users or everyone, the citizen, can uh, check their own 14 days temperature history on their own mobile phone. And um, for the third one, we deploy cloud computing and big data analytics to perform a visualization of tracking. Next. However, with an online solution, with the full online solution, we have another issue coming up, which is how do people take control of their own private and sensitive data? Um, in our solution, we try to, you know, 
uh, make sure that your personal data is not displayed anywhere at any kiosk or at any uh, shop shops. Uh, uh, your personal data is not accessible through the kiosk. Uh, it's only accessible by uh, uh, authorities. And we give an encryption level that is uh, bank safe, bank level safety. Uh, this is what uh, something that I find uh, perhaps lacking in uh, the uh, current solutions uh, handling uh, COVID-19 tracing at this age. Um, so uh, how we tackle this is we introduce this uh, COVE ID. So it's a unique identifier for users generated by the system. So COVE ID is um, a unique number, uh, alphanumeric number for every people who uh, register to our system. And uh, this COVE ID allows for quick contact tracing while protecting users' personal data. So it's like your IC, but instead of using your IC, which is a sensitive data, you replace it with a COVE ID where uh, nobody knows uh, whose who this COVE ID belongs to except for you. And if imagine if you can give this uh, backend huge of big data to the government, then they have uh, uh, this uh, cloud computing and big data analytics to perform the visualization and try to capture um, uh, context uh, that is exposed to uh, a potential positive patient. Next. So uh, moving forward, I, I like to share that I find analytics um, is the essence into the crux of e-governance. Uh, currently, uh, citizen approaches the government for certain service. Uh, proactive services, I, I hope that Moving forward, uh, Malaysia can offer proactive services, proactive governance, which aim to reverse that logic. So instead of the citizen approaching the government for the service, the government should approach the citizen when uh, they identify uh, the citizen uh, entitled for a certain service. So I give an example. Uh, let's say uh, my doctor, for some reason, registered me as an OKU. Um, I automatically get access to benefits and other support measures which I am entitled. Um, I think this is similar to the note shared by Dr. Siti earlier regarding uh, citizen-centric delivery. Uh, I think uh, Tuan Saifu also uh, mentioned this earlier uh, about you know, giving to the society. Uh, so it's all about government to citizen. And thank you so much, Mampu, for spearheading this kind of initiative. I really appreciate it. And perhaps uh, I think uh, moving forward, Mampu can also consider analytics to really improve the governance from the compliance standpoint, like uh, identifying tax fraud, uh, understanding uh, citizen needs, uh, social welfare, and etc. And Tuan Saifu mentioned something very interesting, which is uh, the fake news. How do we manage fake news? Um, social data, uh, sorry, social media now has been like a crucial part of our life. Everybody will, you know, throw their ideas. Uh, share their experiences on social media. So how would you do, uh, I think there's a lot of initiative uh, in Malaysia these days that pull data from the social media and you know study the sentiment behind it. Uh, this should be continued. I, I feel that this kind of analytics is very beneficial for our country. So I hope that uh, this kind of citizen engagement framework can be continued as well. Uh, can you please change the next slide? Okay, so uh, how to do the analytics? So from the academic perspective, um, we always talk about these seven robotic skills. So uh, generally, you may know about enhancing or upskilling uh, human skills. Uh, but uh, in academy, we also have this term called robotic skills. So what robotic skills does is it can perform, this is the processes behind an analytics uh, uh, activities. So uh, the first is the gather, the gathering and collection of data. And then you have number two, the analysis of the data from unstructured to structure, uh, recording and transportation and so forth. So if you can go through all these seven skills, and uh, this is something that government should adopt, uh, if, you are, if you want to fully optimize uh, on the path of this full digitalization, like Dr. Siti mentioned earlier. So I do recommend uh, to look into these seven robotic skills uh, to be adopted. Uh, next. And then um, this is actually the, my last two slides. Uh, uh, this talk is very interesting to me because 
uh, architect Mustafa was talking about how do we prepare for the next big crisis? Um, uh, how me at, at academic, uh, how can AI and automation help uh, to prepare? So I feel that um, if you look into COVID-19, um, we have SARS in 2003, uh, H1N1 pandemic in 2009, MERS 2012, and I think, yes, I think that's those three, SARS, H1N1, and MERS, and now we have COVID-19. So there's actually one similar pattern. Uh, the most important symptom is uh, having fever. Uh, not everyone has it, but you know, in general, uh, a fever is uh, the first clue. So I feel that in preparation for the next big crisis, we should continue this uh, fever monitoring. Um, this can actually, if you do it correctly, we can actually have a global warning system uh, where, you know, if we can uh, project um, uh, fever behavior in countries like hotspots in the world, um, you know, if we have uh, large hotspots from China, then we should delay entry from people from China to our country uh, and try to contain infection uh, via quarantine. Uh, we should also look at adopting technologies to preserve food. Um, I feel that during uh, the three months in uh, PKP, uh, a lot of food was waste wasted because we couldn't transfer the food to uh, uh, some areas. So food wastage was alarming uh, during uh, this pandemic. And I feel that if we can adopt some new technology to preserve food, then it will be very good in uh, preparation for future pandemic. We are, I think I also want to propose uh, the government to look carefully or seriously into urban and vertical farming. Uh, this could really help us uh, 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 prepare. Uh, environmental monitoring is huge. Um, we can, I mean, in my lab, I'm also working on robots to conserve environment. Um, and I'm hopefully by, you know, next year, I can deploy that solution. And I would love to collaborate with government agencies to see if there's any, um, uh, we can work further into that. How can we monitor and conserve our environment uh, using robots and AI and automation? Um, Multi-purpose building, this is something that I actually learned from architect Mustafa. He was talking a lot about how architect now uh, is thinking about uh, a re rethinking or reimagining buildings. Uh, Multi-purpose building, like uh, the other day we converted uh, a warehouse, I think, into hospital. Uh, uh, so I think we need to look into that as well. How do we uh, reinvent uh, buildings? Uh, and um, another point about food. Uh, we need to make sure that we can save food. We need to make sure that we can, you know, increase food supply. We also need to make sure that we have the technology to deliver food when people are under lockdown. Uh, another one is, uh, Tuan Saifu mentioned it earlier regarding infrastructure communication, which is uh, extremely important. I hope 5G will come sooner than later. Um, and uh, to do all this, can you change to the next slide? To do all this, this is where we should invest on the solution coming from Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 has these nine uh, pillars. These nine pillars can work on their own. On their own, they are wonderful. But if you can uh, blend them, uh, use them in a mixture with each other, leveraging on uh, each other's strength, then we can be very serious about this environmental monitoring, uh, building multi-purpose, uh, sorry, building multi-purpose building, uh, looking into new type of vehicle for food delivery, smart delivery, and of course, communication infrastructure. I think that's all for me. This is like a purely from academic standpoint. Uh, I appreciate um, the time given to me to share and I pass it back to architect Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zati. That was uh, uh, eye-opening for us. In fact, I think uh, architects now can look into opportunities of moving into digit, uh, digital research and also analytics. So I think uh, before we go to the question and answer, I just would like to summarize all the three speakers so that we are in the, on the same page, okay? Uh, first, we got the framework. Uh, Mampu has got the framework. They have already done that, uh, Mas Jastra uh, accomplished that with 53 departments. 
So now we only need this question mark, directive and trust. Okay, so I think that would be one of the questions that will be asked because people say, I cannot submit my plans. How the hell I can do work? You know, <laughs> work is money. Okay, next. We talk about business uh, fraternity, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. Saiful was talking about user friendly, you know, uh, don't have a complicated uh, manner of actually navigating the phone or even laptop. Then Dr. Zati put in very uh, smartly. Last time we are all talking about surveys. Now we need to do blending of analytics. So that's actually the crux of the matter. In fact, just a story for all of you. How did we know about COVID-19? Because one of the, uh, how should I say, startup companies in Canada cracked a notice from the Wuhan hospital that they were searching a uh, SARS-like flu uh, condition on the 31st of December 2019. Suddenly, 76,000 articles was actually fished through by this particular hospital and this uh, Canadian startup tracked it and informed WHO. So that is the why, how we got to know about uh, uh, the COVID-19 and it's called COVID-19 was held on 31st December 2019. Okay, now uh, for the questions, uh, I have few questions here, uh, but uh, if you have more questions, I'll be uh, more than happy to uh, ask the panelists. But I have one question here that is actually very pertinent and hold on, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, wait there. All right, I think this is for Dr. Siti. Uh, this is from Leonardo. Government apps and digital infrastructure needs a complete change in digitization and integration. Government approach on this is way behind and is set for a citizen in terms of functionality, response, reliability, and efficiency. We are moving into 5G era, but still it's not very efficient. Uh, Dr. Uh, with uh, what's forward and what's now? Uh, can you enlighten us about this? Because uh, we in PEM are very, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 interested to actually assist in if we can do to make it better. Thank you. Okay. Um, when we are talking about infrastructure, which is infrastructure, right? Uh, in digital government, uh, we have to see in terms of the maturity of the infrastructure in terms of uh, area that we want to address. Of course, there is a plan for 5G in the country, which has not yet uh, been implemented, uh, still at early level. But then uh, during COVID-19, we find out that 40% of the university student doesn't even have a laptop. So which one do you want us to prioritize? Do you want us to embark on 5G with no demand yet? Or do you want to address the student without laptops? So in terms of infrastructure, we have a wide range of needs that we can look into, but the prioritization is still there. So maybe in terms of maturity of the infrastructure of 5G in this case, still at an early stage, but the planning is there. Government has already looked into a lots of areas to implement 5G. We, in fact, have a 5G's uh, same, uh, conference, I think, about uh, last year. Uh, even with uh, the autonomous car, we have been uh, picked as one of the country to uh, possible yeah, opportunity as a test bed for drones, actually. So, um, well, if we look into the uh, development, yes, there is but the prioritization is still there. Well, government is a big enterprise, right? Uh, not only government have the funding, we can actually work towards a new business models, win-win situation, whereby we complement each other in terms of industry, government, academia, to give the solution to the right. Thank you very much, Dr. Siti. Uh, any... Uh do you want to add or is the... Yes, yes, thank you, Mers. I think uh, there are, uh, when you look at any technology, when you want to adopt like 5G or there'll be others, AI, IR 5.4, don't look at technology as it is. You look at where you are, whether you can capitalize on it, whether you can have a return investment, your KPI, what's the impact? 
that's the first question in mind. Are they useful? Sometimes a hybrid solution is better. Sometimes if, it, if it's not a problem, why do you want to change it to, uh, to spend in terms of technology? So step back, ask whether it is useful, then only you move forward. Most of the time, maybe it's hybrid. It's not a 5G issue, yeah? We have IP 4.0, IP yeah. 6.0, IP 9, there are many others that we need to consider also. Yeah, mm, thank you. So they, change, they change your mindset in terms of the holistic of digital solution. Definitely, yeah. Okay, uh, I got one here, uh, which is very related to architecture here. You know, can our federal and local council accept only soft copy and online submission plans? And this will save lots of public businesses push for digitalization and also can save paper, you know? Uh, I remember uh, we in the uh, Productivity Nexus were saying to Pomoda uh, to actually uh, accelerate on this issue like, you know, you have all the servers, the super uh, fast servers in the government and also we already got uh, uh, OSCs which have got this uh, digital submission. But when the day comes, what happens is, oh, I don't have the password for me to operate or I don't have the authority to open that server for you to have a remote server uh, too. But uh, sorry, Dr. Siti, but I think uh, you're the best person to answer this. <laughs> and you all directly instruct it has to open 24-7-365. Thank you. Uh, agreed, agreed on this. Uh, but the issue is nothing to do with IT. It's actually the change of mindset, change of process, and the change of legislation. We are ready. If you look into uh, e kehakiman or e court, they already changed the submission of thousands pages of uh, papers into digital. And they can do it. Why? Because they change the mindset of all the players in the ecosystem. So if you want to do that, you have to change the mindset of the whole ecosystem, not about the servers. <laughs> that is my answer. So uh, Pam, we need to work with her, bring her along. <laughs> and our, our, uh, our, uh, they call it kalau in English, it's actually a reference point. Okay, Dr. Zati. Uh, yes. This one from uh, architect one Sophia herself. Sorry, just now that question was from uh, one Ashraf Muhammad Shamsuddin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one from architect one Sophia herself. Doctor Zati, any smart system available in Malaysia that monitor waste, and if mm -hmm. none, whether this would be a good solution to ensure better waste management, consumer to infrastructure, perhaps to recycling or upcycling. Uh, upcycling. Oh, okay. Very interesting question. Um, so, uh, this is something that, again, uh, coming from the, uh, uh, just now Tuan Saifu mentioned about what is it for, if, you, if, you, if we are to create technologies, if we are to utilize AI and automation, what are they for, what would be the impact, or are we just wasting money doing research? So, this is a good question where, this is where, Technology can enable uh, use cases like this, problems like this. Wastage is an important uh, um, aspect to look at. Uh, myself in the lab, I'm uh, also developing a solution called Hydron, uh, which is stands for Hydra and Drone, which means that I'm trying to drive a robot onto water. And uh, what this robot does is it's uh, specifically to conserve uh, lakes. Uh, number one task is to perform waste management, like if there's rubbish, uh, you, you cannot imagine uh, what I found when I go explore the lakes in my in PJ area. Um, there's a lot of uh, 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 dead bodies, dead bodies of animals, small animals, where uh, even the uh, cleaners does not want to go and pick it up because it's, it's too disgusting <laughs> and it could be potentially hazardous to your health. So in this uh, uh, banners by the robotic solution that the ones that have been in my lab can be uh, uh, helping the government in this manner. So I feel that yes, uh, it is very important for us to move into solutions that look at waste management, upcycling, downcycling, recycling. Um, uh, but we need to start uh, uh, slow, start small. You don't have to. Uh, I know there's a, a robotic. Uh, water robot system that came into Malaysia for a demo. Um, they were cleaning the rivers. 
but it's really big. The, the, the size of the robot is really huge. That costs a lot of money. And if you look at lakes, we have uh, all these corners where large robots cannot go to. So rather than building a large expensive robot, I rather build smaller ones and make them work together to clean a big task or clean a big lake. So I feel that this is very important uh, 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 angle to look at. If you want to use technology, what is it for? Uh, what impact you're looking at? Uh, and the ROI as well. You do not want to be spending millions, but the impact is small. So I feel that, uh, thank you to uh, architect Wen, he said earlier, uh, who post, proposed a question. So myself is into it. Uh, environmental conservation is uh, close to my heart. So uh, my lab is working hard towards that kind of solution. And I do support any uh, effort towards that. And I'm looking for partners. I'm looking for, uh, now I'm working with Nahrim and Span because uh, they are working, they are monitoring the rivers and lakes from Malaysia. So um, I'm also looking to uh, at other agencies if they want to collaborate as well. So that would be my answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, then uh, there's another uh, question here that uh, uh, is coming from uh, Kumaran Siva. Uh, hello, panelists. There was a call to architects of government buildings earmarked for repurposing to act as facilities of various functions in the efforts during C19. Was this successful? You know, uh, you know, uh, and were there any lessons learned uh, to share digital or otherwise uh, from architect Kumaran? Uh, was Mampu called in Dr. Siti uh, on to, towards this, uh, this effect? I know what my apes uh, was actually converted, uh, one, two of the halls are converted to their uh, quarantine and isolation centers. Uh, any others that has actually been part of it? Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have any information on that, but um, uh, prior to COVID, we are looking into some of the institutional, government institutional that's vacant to be repurposed, but not in terms of COVID. Um, I see. Oh, that's good. So, uh, there's another avenue for uh, how to, new works over there. Okay, I've got uh, one situation here that I would like to ask. Uh, I think this is goes to Dr. Zati. Yes. You know, uh, whenever there is its opening uh, of uh, 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 registration, like for instance, for us to move in or to apply, uh, everybody suddenly searched to the website. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we found the news is two hours later, there's the news, oh, the server crashed. So I understand, understand that you are actually working on an anti-crash server uh, <laughs> modality that can cover uh, 100,000 applications within what an hour. So you used uh, us as one of your guinea pigs. So can you enlighten <laughs> that one? Okay. Um, yes. Uh, uh, what you are talking about is uh, regarding the back end. So um, like the engine, now, if you're looking at Ferrari, this is this massive engine inside that takes control of everything. Uh, what makes it look good is the outside, the casing, etc. So that would be the front end. Um, uh, so what, you, what you're, you're seeing is uh, how, uh, uh, how did I do it that I can accept um, a high volume of requests. Uh, we are talking about request to website. Um, how much volume per minute, how much volume per hour. So what you need is to design the backend, to design the database in such a way that it is distributed. So we cannot uh, uh, build a centralized backend. So my team is working hard on, you know, modulizing the backend. So uh, if the request is to register a certain page that it goes to a particular module and another request for another, uh, another uh, task, it will go to other modules. So what you want is not a centralized backend, but a decentralized backend modular that can communicate with each other well. So that would be my proposal to you. If you want to build uh, um, um, uh, this kind of backend, you need to look into um, uh, there's this term called fleet management uh, in, in uh, research. Uh, fleet management essentially handles uh, a, a request in modular form. So if you have that capacity or you have that kind of technology, and inshallah, 
100,000 requests per minute, or a million requests per hour will not be a problem. Thank you very um, much for the answer. Uh, doctor, you want to add on to that? Yes, can I add on? Uh, yeah. It's actually based on uh, what Dr. Zati mentioned is on the uh, readiness of the uh, processing, right? Mm. Yes. Um, uh, what I want to add on is that uh, uh, complement to that, we should have a modular architecture. Mm. So now we are looking into microservices and how you mm. develop the applications mm. so that it is not actually uh, tied to the processing power. Mm. Um, that's why we are looking into the software as a service on the cloud. And mm. microservices on the cloud. So not only um, as, uh, for example, like WhatsApp, we don't know where they put the application and where they put the. Uh, so actually, the architecture, the model architecture. Now we are uh, embarking on it. We call it uh, microservices architecture. Okay. Ah, uh, let me jump in and just give comment from the industry view because we started from centralized database mainframe. And then we go into client server, that's decentralized. And then lately, we are going to internet, big data, so it's centralized ballet. So now, I think that, the, as you mentioned, and after city, it is decentralizing because of the IoT, because of the robotics, intelligent gadgets, and all that. So yes, correct. the point is that we have to embrace technology, so it's not static. So important thing for us to whatever application, so we have to be on our feet to make sure that we then cost effectiveness of applying uh, the, the solution. So collaboration is important with industry, government and industry. And most importantly, we have to be modular as what Dr. Dr. Siti, Dr. Zaki comment. <laughs> but okay. more importantly, underlying it, we must change our culture. Mm. Even though recycle and all that, right? We don't mm. have to rely on the system, rely on the government. The individual have to make sure at the house level, they pack in a nice proper manner mm. and divide the, so the same with technology. We have to educate and make sure that our citizen, uh, and importantly most, the gig economy is coming in. A lot of people are working from home. So make sure we listen to our new uh, millennia, our needs so that we can then address mm. them accordingly. They are our future. So make sure we do that, yeah? Thank you. Okay. Uh, that I, uh, somebody just uh, sent me a question here, okay? Why, why is our internet so slow? And I think Dr. Siti <laughs> was uh, saying, you know, uh, you, you, got to, you got to actually equip people with laptops, cheap laptops. Last time I remember there was a Mimos punya uh, initiative that one laptop cost only what, 1,500 ringgit or 2,000 ringgit. I think we should uh, uh, make that uh, available and re, uh, to re engineer that and to make it uh, to be post COVID uh, applicable. And, you know, why is our internet slow? <laughs> okay, um, uh, I answer in three areas. Yeah. Um, when the, uh, uh, the user, the right, lah, kita yang, yang last, the last, the last person that get the uh, services uh, feel slow. We have to look into one is the device, the second one is the infra, the, another one is the uh, allocations given, right? So uh, when we look at the infra right nowadays, um, laptop is not something that is uh, very popular among the youngsters. They prefer handphones, right? Or smartphones. So the way that we define fast or slow, is based on the devices. And then we have to look into the services that you subscribe to, the telcos. So it depends on their uh, so-called data plan or internet connections, it still goes back to the fiberizations of <laughs> the country. <laughs> so, what can we say? Can, can I add? Yeah. <laughs> no, Siri, you get 10, right? Yes. So because it goes back to what is the line that given to you? Can I, so, can I jump into and, you know, uh, add something? Uh, it's very interesting that uh, the question is why our internet is slow. Because uh, for me, 
uh, dealing with IOTs, uh, robotic solution, talking to my backend, you know, and I have AI trying to come in and AI trying to, you know, um, doing some analytics on what my robot found. Uh, internet is crucial to me. And I, I investigated why our internet is slow. So why it is slow is because um, to get internet, they have to go through Singapore. For uh, Beirut, right? Yes. Uh, Actually, uh, the, the lines. The lines went through Singapore before it reaches Mersing. So we need to, you know, there's a there's a gateway, internet gateway in Singapore before it can come to Malaysia. So um, I've recently read. Um, I uh, we have this uh, uh, in Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, Maya, M I M I E R. So they recently highlighted that uh, one of their crouching tiger plan to revive Malaysian economy is uh, this hyperloop. They do not they do not want um, the internet gateway to bypass uh, Singapore first. So the, there's a plan in, in, in place where we want from the western uh, the fiber from the western country come into uh, straight to Mersing. And then uh, from Mersing, it goes back to US, Japan, Hong Kong, etc. Um, and from Mersing, uh, there's a discussion on to wire it to Lumut and Langkawi to build our 5G, center of 5G there. But this is the initiative in plan. Why it is in slow? It is partly because the physical infrastructure goes through Singapore as an internet gateway. So imagine the surrounding country had to go through Singapore's data center. Singapore is over convoluted. Singapore's data center is over convoluted already. So Malaysia, if we can play this well, we can become the new data center. So internet from the Western countries to go through Philippines, uh, Thailand, Indonesia have to come through us first. So we can become the internet that way. And by then, our internet will be fast. <laughs> so well, it goes back to the business model. Yes. Right. Well, uh, we give just a very simple <laughs> analogy. I mean, Models. Low, right? I can do meeting, I can serve and all that, even in the car and all. So I think you fall back to the user. Yeah. Because we don't want the user, the serious user, just playing games. And we don't want the user just query on something else that's not right. So even during the COVID, um, telcos are giving gigabyte free daily and all that. So they do that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then I said, a lot of the entrepreneurs, the startup, they can do it. Uh, mm. They all hang out dekat um, uh, Starbucks. They hang out dekat Kedai Mama. Internet dah shut, lagi laju. And you can do a lot of the video conferencing. I've tested it on any video conferencing. A matter of go to where you need to use. So first point, look at the user, look at how to use it, pay as little as possible. The second mm -hmm. part, abaulah, yeah, infrastructure. I think government uh, have put in about 21 billion for mm -hmm. telcos to build up infrastructure. Mm -hmm. All depend. So you look at the urban area, you look at the rural area, there are USD programs, billions of dollars. So a matter of implementation. So I don't think it is the problem. Slow to maknanya user tak tahu nak gunakan. Ah itu. Kedua, ah mungkin dia gunakan dengan betul tapi ada masalah. Ah itu you you figure out the company to pay. Right now myself, my company pays for my iPad and for my iPhone. I can go anywhere, I still serve my purpose. I can do a lot of video searching and all that. So utilization, then lastly, government kena serve lah uh, rakyat. So the infrastructure has to be done correctly. We are better than many countries. So I want to say. So don't complain aja. But we <laughs> must be part of our solution rather than a problem. Definitely. I wish I wish I can continue this discussion. Agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Siti. Okay. Apa? I, I give you one apa, one paragraph. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's say digital first uh, by default. Uh, Dr. Zati. Uh, this is your, your, your homework for me, isn't it? Yeah. Um, AI, auto, AI automation towards proactive governance. That's right. Well, government says 6R, I would say 5C. Be current, updated, have the capacity, yeah, confidentiality, the security, clarity in how to use it, and finally for the country. So five. Wow. <laughs> okay. Your five words. Okay, my five words uh, is 
it's never le late to learn, but there are many things that we could learn from. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I think we, I would love to continue this discussion, but I think you all have been an awesome participants and I still see high numbers here, 230, you know, still ho hooking on to this, you know, just, uh, listening to all these uh, arguments. We are not here to actually find faults or find uh, uh, who's right, who's wrong, but we are trying to make sure Malaysia, uh, our fraternity, and we have Mampu here, our friend Tuan Saiful here from Brussels and Dr. Zah you know, one of the budding stars in AI, you know, machine learning and machine to human. I think uh, we need to continue the discussion, so, but uh, in another forum. So uh, we have come to the end of the session, but before we end, please accept our sincere apologies should there be any shortcomings, you know. However, we hope that you have gained as much from the papers and question and answer session today as we have. So thank you for your participation and being an awesome participant also uh, and a pleasant evening. So we hope to see you at the uh, PAM online series, Kata Kota edition three, uh, COVID-19 compliant homes and developments. So amongst our guests are architects from Majlis Perbandaran Hang Tuah Jaya. They are one of the sustainable cities in Malaysia and also the uh, big data city and architects from private practice and also in the education sector. So please be reminded to book your digital seat soon and be safe, stay safe, and think safety. Kita jaga kita. Thank you very much, all participants, and also to panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.